Hello friends and welcome back to the third day of my 2018 Game of the Year Bonanza. Today we have five more categories to talk about. Best short time game, best world building, best style, best mechanics and best story, each featuring four nominees and one winner. As ever these are only my own personal picks but I'd love to hear what you would have chosen in the comments down below. Without further ado, let's dive on in to the awards for day three. Best Short Time Game Astrobot's Rescue Mission VR tends to work best in short bursts and Astrobot's relatively quick levels and even shorter challenges suited that perfectly. Generally speaking, I found myself playing through one or two levels per session along with their accompanying challenge missions and that was just enough to immerse myself in Astrobot's multitude of colourful virtual playgrounds without suffering any unfortunate VR side effects. The controls are simple enough that it's easy to just pick up and play and the hidden collectibles and tougher challenges meant there was plenty to keep me coming back day after day. Dead Cells. Most of my normal runs in Dead Cells are probably a bit too long to qualify for this category, although you can quit to the game at any time and pick back up right to where you left off, which is a welcome feature. But it earns its place on this list thanks to the excellent Daily Challenge feature, which, like most of its type, gives all players the same pre-rolled single level, usually packed to the brim with side pass, items and upgrades, and tasks you with scoring as many points as possible in just four and a half minutes. It's a frantic, quick burst of action direct into your veins, and it's thrilling. Onrush. If there's a better way to get that quick rush of adrenaline than smashing your way through a rampant horde of bikes, buggies and trucks careening along at blistering speeds, then I haven't found it yet. A round or two of Onrush really gets the blood flowing with frantic automotive tussles, daring jumps, spectacular crashes and that ripping soundtrack wailing away over it all. The main progression offers a ton of challenges to keep you busy and the always in its nature of Onrush's combat focused gameplay means there's always something exciting happening even if you're not playing your best. It's over almost as quickly as it started but there's always time for one more race. Super Smash Bros Ultimate Everyone is here, and that means potentially hundreds of hours of quickfire brawls with nearly all of your favourite Nintendo and Ninja adjacent characters are at your fingertips. In fact, being on the Switch means you can literally take the Smash Brothers anywhere you go now. Rounds last just a few minutes, and oftentimes stages in World of Light can be even shorter than that, but there's almost endless fun to be had bashing out a quick match or two, and if you do have the time that one more turn potential can rack up a handful of games into several dozen more over the course of an entire afternoon. The main game of Dead Cells is fantastic, but it can be quite a slow progression as runs tend to be quite long and drawn out when you're as cautious and intent on scouring every inch of the map the way I instinctively am. This meant I'd often spend an hour plus working my way slowly through the levels with a mostly consistent build, which might be changed up once or twice thanks to a lucky drop but otherwise was kept pretty much the same. One of the greatest things about the daily challenges is that they flood you with gear from the entire item pool rather than just what you already have unlocked. This means that it's a great way to see some of the things you might have in store going Going forwards, but the short runtime also lets you get to grips with weapons you might not ordinarily spend time with and not worry about risking an entire playthrough on a weapon you're not familiar with. Additionally, because each run is guaranteed to be under 5 minutes, you're encouraged to play through multiple times to improve your score, gradually exploring more of the map and trying to take down even more incidental enemies before clashing with the big boss. As a result, playing daily challenges has ended up being so much more than a way to get that condensed Dead Cells feeling, it's also dramatically improved my overall game, teaching me to play more aggressively, dodge through enemies and discover powerful combos I can utilise to pick off dangerous foes quickly. It's also let me practice the later areas from the main game without the fear of losing a ton of progress if I died. If you want to up your Dead Cells game, I can't recommend the daily challenges enough and you'll have an absolute blast along the way too. Best World Building God of War 
God of War's stunning Norse scenery doesn't take long to make an impact with its flowing rivers, lush forests and secret houses hidden under a giant turtle. The spectacle only grows as Kratos and Atreus row out into the Lake of Nine, this vast expanse of water which is home to Tyr's majestic golden temple, the beating heart of God of War's world. From here you can explore the mountains and caverns of Midgard, ever more locations opening up to you as the world serpent Jormungandr slowly slithers out from under the depths and causes the entire lake's water level to fall dramatically. Furthermore, using the temple to travel between the realms is an extremely satisfying piece of design from the physicality of the temple's rotation in the lake to the slithering branches of the world tree in its central chamber. Monster Hunter World After 14 years of maps made up of tiny interconnected arenas, Monster Hunter finally gets the truly open world that this game's name promises. Each of the habitats is this sprawling, interconnected web of paths, caverns, dunes, plains, beaches and more, each a thriving ecosystem with its own vast range of inhabitants from the tiniest bugs and buns to the most feared apex predators. The creatures make their way around the map in a believable natural way, heading out to hunt or foraging on local resources or even pausing for a poop. Similarly, exploring them for yourself is a treat from the initial steps of getting horrendously lost in the undergrowth of the ancient forest to learning how to ping yourself up to the highest plateau of the coral highlands in seconds with your grappling hook. Red Dead Redemption 2 Rockstar's lovingly crafted take on the Old West is simply stunning to wander through, from the vast plains of the Heartlands up to the snowy peaks of the Grizzlies or down to the muggy swamps of Lagrasse and the bustling streets of Saint Denis. Every time you load up the game you're greeted with the sight of Arthur kicking back and taking in the nearby scenery, and every time I couldn't help but sit there and soak it all in with him for a good few minutes. As someone predisposed to role-playing within narrative games, I can speak no more highly to what a pleasure simply riding from town to town and going about my everyday business was than that I barely even noticed the almost complete lack of actual fast travel. Return of the Oberdin. Oberdin takes place in a tight, compressed environment, with the majority of events confined to just the four floors of the ship. As you uncover more and more crew members, the decks slowly fill up with an increasing number of bodies until the entire place looks like the aftermath of a particularly raucous house party. Discovering ways to access new scenes and gradually revealing people's movements as you progress through each chapter leads to some jaw-dropping reveals. But for as many corpses pile up by the end, each part of the ship feels so distinct and every scene is so intrinsically tied to its surroundings that I always knew instantly exactly exactly whereabouts any given corpse was located when I needed to backtrack. It's always so nice to see a series finally be able to realise its potential in full, and Monster Hunter World filling in all those gaps to create these wonderful open environments teeming with life that past entries had always hinted at is an absolute delight. Each of World's five major areas are these huge possibility spaces ripe for exploration and adventure. They're big enough and complex enough that your first forays into them feel intimidating, you as this tiny individual scrabbling your way through the undergrowth or clambering your way up and around to the highest peaks on the map. Reaching the summit of an area feels magical thanks to the real verticality of the areas. But despite that initial sense of scale, the maps are also manageable in size and distinctly designed such that you grow to learn them inside and out by the latter stages of your adventure. As you become more familiar with each zone, you uncover suitable clearings to set up fast travel camps and you start to spot ways to navigate around at higher speed, such as with the wedge beetles that let you zip up cliffs and swing quickly through connecting areas. No one part on any map looks quite the same, so it becomes second nature to know exactly where you're at and eventually you don't even need guidance to navigate your way around. Of course, the real cherry atop world's cake is that these areas are so much more than just the setting for your epic battles. They're packed with useful resources to gather and tools you can make use of in a fight, including walls that can be leapt off for stylish aerial assaults, thick crystalline stalactites that can be sent crashing onto your targets below, and wandering toads who kick out clouds of paralyzing or soporific mist when disturbed that will leave even the most dangerous adversaries vulnerable. The worlds of Monster Hunter Worlds feel truly alive, teeming hubs of potential goodies, threats, and utilities and getting to know their every corner and secret as you gradually evolve from terrified newbie to master hunter is a supremely satisfying experience. Best Style Donut County 
There's a calming, zen-like atmosphere to gently tumbling every plant pot and person throughout Donuts County into an ever-growing hole. The soft, flat shading and simple designs give the world an almost miniature model quality, and the soft jams that accompany the majority of the levels gently soothe you as you quietly wreak havoc upon this small, laid-back neighbourhood. There's something endlessly satisfying about watching all these rigid everyday objects slowly tip over or bounce around as you jiggle them down into the unforgiving void below. But you're never allowed to drift too far off into the land of bliss as each level rounds out with this funky jam to celebrate your successful mischief. Monster Hunter World 2018's world brings Monster Hunter's fantastic fashion into full high definition glory. There are bespoke armor sets for every monster you encounter, plus dozens of weapons across all the categories which get increasingly intricate in design whilst retaining the looks of the monster they came from, so you can easily tell at a glance exactly which terrifying beast someone had to spar with to get their precious gun lance. Taking things out into the field, all of those weapons come with their own unique set of smooth, stylishly choreographed attack animations and a wealth of sparks, shimmers and explosions to boot. Every big hit and inch perfect dodge makes you feel like a certain Justifiable badass, dancing your way around these majestic beasties as you bring them crashing down. Return of the Obra Dinn from your first tentative steps aboard the Obra Dinn, there's a fascinating sense of place to the whole experience. Hearing your footsteps creak across deck as the cool silence of the evening is broken by the soft slap of waves against the hull is incredibly atmospheric. The dramatic one bits monochrome visuals that harken back to computers of old give the whole experience this unforgettable look, customizable to your own personal taste in retro machines. There's an extremely gratifying tactility to the way you flip open your mysterious pocket watch of death, the memento mortem, and similarly for flipping through the pages of your journal, which gives you those real old school detective vibes. Tetris Effect in retrospect, the simple, eternally gratifying puzzle mechanics of Tetris and the dreamlike audiovisual experiences of Tetsuya Mizuguchi were always a match made in heaven. But even seeing Tetris Effect in action doesn't quite convey just how wonderful it feels to actually play. Hearing the musical fills play in time with your actions as the visual bump and flare and glimmer alongside each piece you place and each line you clear makes the whole game feel in sync with your rhythm of play in a way even Miz's past titles haven't quite managed for me. Then you enter the zone and time seems to come to a stop around you as you slot together row after row after row in search of that glorious perfectress. There's something magical about the way everything in Return of the Obra Dinn comes together to form its complete package, from the old school monochromatic visuals to its bold, haunting soundtrack. Each time I loaded up a memory, the trademark Memento Mortem jingle playing as the screen fades to black and heard those few snippets of initial activity aboard the boat before it cuts to the snapshot and the music kicks in, I found chills running up my spine. Every new scene there's a palpable tension as you wonder exactly what could possibly await you in this next terrible tableau. The visual style gives you just enough detail to pick up every key feature necessary but also obscures things just enough that it takes a while at the start of every scene to start processing what you're actually seeing and means that the more you move around a given memory the more things will start to pop out to you. Actually walking around an instant and periodically pulling out your notebook whether in game or in real life to jot down some new observations or hypotheses made me feel like a real detective in a way that few mystery games manage to pull off and when you clock three fates successfully that resulting stinger confirming your suspicions immediately fires off the endorphins. Best Mechanics Into the Breach Turn-based grid strategy games are so often about predicting what your opponents might do next and working around that. Into the Breach turns that concept on its head by telling you at all times exactly what is going to happen after your next turn, right down to the specific order of actions. The result is almost more of a puzzle game, albeit one where there is often no perfect solution. Do you ensure all civilian buildings are protected this turn, even if that means taking heavy damage to one of your precious mechs? Or do you take the hit, hoping you can restore the lost power later but preserving your pilot for the fights ahead? Sometimes sacrifices have to be made, but it's all in your hands. Monster Hunter World 
It's staggering just how vastly different Monster Hunter can feel to play based on your chosen weapon type. I'm used to games with a variety of weapon selections, but they usually just offer choices such as speed versus power, or aesthetic changes. While some weapons share crossover aspects, the difference in playstyle between a greatsword, a lance, a bow, or an insect glaive feels so dramatically distinct. They all have such different tools at their disposal which let them excel at certain tasks. Throwing all the opportunities to use the environment to your advantage for mounting attacks, crushing rockfalls, gushing rapids and more, and you'll still be discovering new ways to play hundreds of hours in. Onrush Whereas other arcadey smash em up races such as Burnout are a little more freeform with their crash physics, Onrush feels a lot stricter on interactions and focuses more on ramming the right parts of your vehicle into opponents with clinical accuracy, as well as utilising systems such as the landing boost from big drops effectively to keep pace with other cars. It's a little weird at first, but as I got more accustomed to the feel, I stopped falling behind the pack every race and really began to appreciate the precision required to balance your aggression and objective play with ensuring you open yourself up for attack as little as possible. The takedowns feel more premeditated than other games, but just as satisfying. Return of the Obra Din. Wandering the floors of the Obra Dinn, slowly piecing together the identities of the poor souls who were on board, is an incredibly compelling task that had me taking pages upon pages of real world notes just to keep everything together. The careful layout of every single piece of each grisly diorama, from the mid-motion freeze frames of the various crew members and creatures of the deep to the seemingly minor details which hold clues to some of the crew's most well-hidden identities, gives a wonderful depth to every scene as you slowly peel the layers away from the obvious takeaways to uncover the hidden truths. It's one thing to break from genre convention by giving the player perfect information in a situation they might not otherwise expect it, but Into the Breach really solidifies itself as a puzzle strategy title with how it allows you to really toy around with the board prior to making your final moves. As long as you don't actually fire off any attacks, you can move your pieces back and forth as much as you want, which helps to plan out potential solutions and see how they might actually play out. In most circumstances, you'll be able to come up with a somewhat satisfactory result pretty quickly, but actually finding the best one you can could be a much longer process. Every single squad is so dramatically different in their toolset that each new team you unlock can feel almost like relearning the basics from scratch, but there's a wonderful delight to the moment when a team's specialty clicks and you start to line up their perfect strategies. The upgrades which can be bought or found mid-run make a distinct enough difference to your playstyle that no two runs ever feel quite alike, and the option to take on the final battle after anywhere from two to four completed islands brings in a more grand scale risk assessment layer where you need to judge your team's current power level and what its potential growth could be. Of course, the longer you fight, the stronger you'll be, but the same holds true for your enemies, and so a build which is super strong out the gate might be better served trying to catch the Vec bugs off guard early on, rather than attempting to eke out a tiny bit more power and risking falling behind the curve later on. On every level of play, Into the Breach asks you to make decisions to which there is no truly correct answer, but gosh does it feel satisfying when you manage to successfully execute a flawless strategy to any extent. Best Story Spoiler warning time. We're into obvious spoiler territory for this one as I'll be discussing the stories of Celeste, The Missing, Return of the Obra Dinn, and Yakuza 6 in some detail. If you're eager not to have those stories spoiled for you then I'd recommend ducking out now, but if you're all good to go then let's get right on with things. <laughs> Celeste Celeste tells a relatively simple tale of one girl's adventure up Celeste Mountain, but Madeline's journey is about so much more than the climb, with the mountain forcing her to confront her inner demons head on. Whilst Madeline is often able to find solace from Theo, a friendly face she meets early on in her trek, occasionally she must strive on alone, chased by a physical manifestation of her own internal anxieties and mental struggles. Eventually, Madeline tries to shut these emotions out, only for them to overwhelm her, symbolically driving her back down the mountain. It's only then, with the advice of a mysterious old lady, that Madeline realises she must accept who this part of her is to succeed, as the two parts of Madeline combine to work together in triumphant ascent to the summit. The Missing Quick content warning for self-harm and suicidal ideation here. 
As JJ makes her way through the bizarre world of the Island of Memories, you start to piece bits of her life together through the text she sends back and forth to those around her. It slowly transpires that the game's grisly core mechanic of injuring yourself to progress represents the suffering JJ inflicts on herself and the pressure forced on her by her religious mother over her abnormal relationships and strange behaviours. We finally learn that JJ is a transgender woman whose identity was publicly outed causing her to suffer teasing in school, anger at home, and constant self-doubt and fear about the positive relationships she did have, ultimately leading to a suicide attempt during which the game's events are taking place in JJ's dreamscape. For such a dark approach to a sensitive topic, White House Studios managed to craft a narrative that is surprisingly well handled and incredibly affecting. Thankfully, despite her immense suffering, JJ and Emily actually get their happy ending, with JJ revived from her attempt by paramedics and her and Emily embracing. Return of the Oberdin. The Oberdin's tale very quickly reveals itself to be a little more than a mutinous scuffle, as one of the earliest scenes reveal the ship to be under attack from what seems to be a legendary kraken. However, as you uncover more, it becomes clear that this was far more than a chance encounter. As each piece slots into place, you learn of the tragedy of the Formosan passengers, one of them framed for murder by a nefarious crew member eager to steal the glimmering treasure the Formosans had brought aboard, of the mysterious creatures who had tried to reclaim said treasure only to be brought in captive, and of the terrifying soldiers of the sea who came aboard the ship to rescue their kidnapped brethren, and the resulting bargain the captain and one of his crewmates made in a vain attempt to secure their own safe return. Arranging the complete narrative in my head made for an utterly compelling piece of non-linear fiction in a way that really leans on the medium's strengths. Yakuza 6 While Yakuza 6's central arc follows Kiryu's search to find those responsible for putting his adopted daughter Haruka into a coma, it ends up, as all things in Yakuza do, spiralling out across the divide between the old and new generations of the Tojo clan, decades of undocumented Chinese children smuggled into Onomichi by the Sayo tribe, the return of the Korean Jingwon Mafia, and even a secret battleship, the Yamato 2, built in secret at the close of World War II, and kept hidden for decades to protect the reputation of those involved in its creation. What starts as a simple family tale blows out into perhaps the series' most grand-scale conspiratorial politics yet, and it's truly something to behold. Y Yamato. For as outlandish as some of the unravelling web of the criminal underworld gets, Yakuza 6 retains those core family values at its centre throughout. Underneath all the political intrigue and bluster, this is a tale about Yuta, the secret heir to the Sayo tribe and the father to Haruka's son Haruto. It's about the Hirose family, Yuta's closest friends, and their goofball leader Nagamo who reminds Kiryu so much of himself. It's about the tension between the ambitious Tsuneo Iwami and his powerful father Haito, and likewise that between Sayo leader Big Lo and his own son Jimmy. And to wrap things back around, Yakuza 6 closes on Kiryu giving up everything to protect those he loves and writing a letter to Daigo Dojima, a man he'd always considered his son but never truly treated as such. Yakuza 6 also deals heavily in forgiveness. As the main story finds characters seeking forgiveness for their actions, many of the sub-stories reflect on similar themes. Kiryu finds old acquaintances, such as Pocket Circuit Fighter who feels distant from his son because he's afraid of him growing up to be like he was, or Munan Suzuki, remorseful for his part in the Munan Cho Heptanast scam and desperate to protect others from their evil ways. Even many of the members of the Satuchi Warriors baseball team and the patrons of the new Gaudi snack bar are all looking to make good on something they felt was missing or wrong in their lives. Yakuza 6 is a game which says that it's never too early or too late to seek to put right the mistakes you felt you've made in your past. And yet for all the threads it weaves along its way, Yakuza 6 brings them all together in a pretty satisfying manner. It offers a little closure on some old characters, both major and minor. It ties up several loose ends while still leaving its remaining players with some big things to look forward to in their futures. And it sees Kiryu solve things in just the same impulsive selfless way he always has done right down to the last. If this truly is the last adventure of the Dragon of Dojima, it was a wonderful way to go out.
And that wraps up the third day of awards. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, a like would be greatly appreciated and I would love to hear what you would have chosen in the comments down below. Come back tomorrow for more awards, including most esports, best friendship, best ongoing support, best sound design and best ending. I've been Ken and I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers!